3x3. Uh, right? And we can now simplify this into x4 is equal 30 minus 9 is 21. Then we have uh, uh, plus, okay, what do we have here? We have minus 1 quarter x2 plus x2. This is plus 3 quarters. It becomes minus 3 quarters x2. Then we have, uh, um, uh, 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 okay, then we have x3. Uh, 3x3 minus 1 half x3, this is 2 and a half x3, so uh, it will be uh, it will be minus 2.5 x3 um, and uh, uh, we have plus 1 quarter x6. Let's write this as uh, 5 over 2. Okay? And you do exactly the same with x5. Right? You will get something here. And the very last one, well, this is the one that we are using to eliminate. It will be just uh, x1 is equal to 9 minus 1 quarter uh, x2 uh, minus 1 half x3 and uh, uh, minus 1 quarter x6. What is x5? Let me just write it here. Uh, x5 happens to be, I'll just, uh, you can compute it at home, but it turns out to be 6 minus 3 halves uh, x2 minus 4 x3 uh, plus 1 quarter x6, right? So now these are our new constraints. Right? And our new objective is uh, uh, this one. Right? Uh, let's see. Where did I write it? Here it is. Uh, so, new objective is 27 uh, plus 1 quarter x2 plus 1 half x3 minus 3 quarters x6. Right? And how, um, what can we do now? We cannot increase x6 because it has negative coefficient. But we can increase either x2 or x3, right? Because at the moment, they are all, uh, both are zeros. Now, let's see, say we choose uh, to deal with, uh, to increase x2. How much can I increase x2 without violating positivity of x4? Well, 3 quarters of x2 <coughs> has to be smaller of 20, or equal than 21 which means that x2 has to be smaller than uh, 84 divided by 3. How much can I increase x2 without violating these constraints? Well, 3 halves uh, So you get the idea. This is essentially walking along the edges of a, uh, of a simplex, right? This is why it's called the right simplex method. Uh, if you imagine this uh, all happening in a six-dimensional space, uh, um, 
And uh, so let's quickly Okay, what is the uh, uh, gosh, I sent it into stratosphere. Uh, let's see. The next is so we have uh, three quarters. I'll write it down so the camera can see. Three quarters x two is smaller or equal. Uh, no, no, we got it. Uh, x two has to be smaller or equal than eighty four over three. Uh, then we have. Uh, the, the constraint that uh, uh, the second one that uh, three halves of x2 has to be smaller than 6 or equal to 6 which implies x2 is smaller than 12 divided by 3 which is 4 and uh, finally from the third one we know that one quarter of x2 has to be smaller or equal than 9, which implies that x2 is uh, smaller than uh, equal 36, which is the tightest condition. It's this one, right? So now what we do, we change uh, the uh, the value, what did we have? We had x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. Uh, x1 was 9. We will push x2 as much as we can. It, this will become 4. Uh, and now we can compute from the equations that I just erased. You can compute what uh, x4, x5 will be, and because this 4 comes from the third equation, uh, x5 will become 0, right? And uh, um, uh, whatever is x6. And so now what you do is, uh, uh, because x2 cannot exceed 4, it becomes useless. Right, so from here, we will solve uh, for, um, uh, for x2 and eliminate it again from the objective and uh, uh, the constraints. And you keep doing that for as long as in the objective there exists at least one positive factor. And as you can see here, signs keep changing, and one can show that in principle you can have n factorial many uh, changes of sign, and the simplex can run really, really slow, but uh, uh, for some reason, uh, in practice, it literally never happens, and it's widely uh, used uh, today uh, in fact, for the latest MATLAB uh, uh, a version of simplex called dual simplex that does the things uh, simultaneously for primal and dual is the default uh, linear programming routine. So this is how, so you simply see for as long as you have uh, in the constraint a variable with positive factor, you try to push it up. How much can you push it up? The constraints tell you uh, how much you can uh, push it up without uh, violating positivity of the variables. And you keep doing that until all the coefficients in the objective become negative, and then clearly you cannot increase more. And notice all the values of the variables on the right um, all the values of the variables on the right will be uh, zero, right? And uh, uh, the variables on the left will produce values that will increase the value of the objective. 
Uh, and as I say, that's exactly, so you see it's a very, very natural um, algorithm, and it was discovered, uh, I forget the guy who did it, but it was discovered uh, early 20th century, and independently also by the Russian mathematician uh, Kantorovich, and they shared Nobel Prize for uh, discovering this uh, algorithm. We, why Nobel Prize for this? Because it has huge number of applications in economics. And it even has applications in design of linear, of fi finite impulse response filters, uh, which I might show you if we decide to go uh, in this direction. It's a very neat application. Okay, before we move uh, uh, to show that max flow mean cut is actually just a linear programming uh, uh, problem in disguise. Uh, I want to tell you a few tricks when it comes to using linear programming. Here you can see that it was crucial that the variables are positive, huh? right, for the operation of the simplex. But in real life, uh, Often there are uh, problems when naturally formulated. Uh, they are not uh, variables can be both positive or negative. This is solved by a simple trick. You replicate each variable twice. So if you have, for example, variables x1, x2, and x3 that can have both positive and negative values, you introduce variables y1, y2, y3, and z1, z2, z3, and now you replace x1 by y1 minus z1. You replace everywhere x2 by y2 minus z2, and you replace everywhere x3 by y3 minus z3, and you do put requirements y uh, i and uh, z i, they are all non-negative. But because one can be either larger or smaller than the other, it will allow you to have both positive and negative values for the original variables. So you double the number of variables, uh, so the problem becomes larger, and this of course has computational cost, but this is how how you do it. And uh, modern linear programming uh, algorithms can solve gigantic <laughs> systems uh, with thousands of equations uh, and uh, thousands of variables. The trickiest part, and this came to bite me when I was playing with this signal processing uh, algorithm, is uh, sometimes uh, the solution, the constraints, have almost unique solution. And the solver has great difficulty to find initial feasible solution. Just values of the variables that uh, uh, satisfy the initial inequalities. So that's the hard part. Once you find the initial solution, then it's just walking on the simplex uh, along the edges, uh, uh, monotonically increasing the value of the objective. Uh, but uh, finding initial, if the problem is tight, uh, right, if the space in which, uh, if these inequalities uh, define a very narrow piece of uh, uh, hyperspace, right, uh, uh, here, it, well, it, here it will be, three-dimensional space if it's, uh, if it's very thin, right? If, it's, uh, if it looks, uh, if intersection, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be tricky to, uh, to find the starting uh, point. Okay, um, so then, then another trick which we will use, in fact, if I show you how you can design a gripple filters without using uh, this part, uh, how is it called? Park. Parks Sorry? Parks McClellan. Uh, say it a bit louder. Parks McClellan. Parks McClellan, which is a misnomer. How should we call the algorithm? 
who was the inventor of the algorithm in the, I believe, in, 20, in 20s of the 19th century, it was Remes. So it was called, this is why it's actually called the Remes Exchange. Um, uh, but uh, because Remes was Russian, uh, we are not very willing to give Russians credit for anything except spying. <laughs> Okay, so um, to, to design ripple filters, we will need the following uh, trick. Uh, very often, um, uh, uh, okay, let's see. Should I give you an example or, um, yeah, uh, well, we will see example <coughs> later on. Sometimes natural definition actually looks as follows. Uh, is uh, A11 x1 plus A12 x2 plus, plus An xn. Uh, you want this uh, not just to be smaller than some value b1, but you actually want uh, that uh, the absolute value of uh, uh, this uh, uh, be smaller than b1. How do we... Uh, Solve this problem. Let me not make a mistake uh, here. What do I want to um, do? Well, let's do an example and then if you make I'll display if you force me that I formulate it correctly. Let's do the following problem. Assume that you are given a, uh, uh, the following problem. Say you are given a uh, set of points, right? And you want to fit a line that is as close as possible to these points, right? One possibility of doing that would be, which one? We, we did this method. Huh? In what sense should the line be as close as possible to these points? What are the possible senses? Huh? What do these squares do? So assume that this is uh, point uh, x1 and value y1. This is point uh, x2 and the value is y2. This is point x3 and the value is y3. And this is point uh, y, well, let me slightly this is kind of inconvenient because the line is almost flat, so let me make the line look like this. And the points, well, if they can look like that. So one uh, possibility is uh, to require that the sum of the squares uh, of these distances uh, is uh, as small as possible. So this will be the best fit in the sense of least square. So you will simply set this problem as follows. You will say, well, my y will be of the form uh, ax plus b. I want to find a and b such that the following holds. Uh, uh, why, uh, that uh, uh, ax1 plus b minus y1 squared, what is this? This is the value at the line at this coordinate, and this is the point that we have. Plus 
AX2 plus B minus Y2 squared plus uh, A times X3 plus B minus Y3 uh, squared, uh, and then finally plus A X4 plus B minus Y4 uh, squared is as small as possible. This is typical least squares problem, right? You want L2 distance between points on the line and given points, sum of the squares to be as small as possible. That's called least squares. But you can also measure the, distance, the quality of the fit by what is the largest uh, discrepancy, right? That would be the uniform norm. This is L2 norm. We will spoke about, speak about this later. In the uniform norm, we want to minimize this. Minimize uh, max of the absolute value of the the difference uh, uh, A1 plus B1, uh, sorry, A1 uh, X, uh, A X1 plus B minus Y1, then A X2 plus B minus Y2, and finally a x3 plus b minus y3, and we have another one. And the last one is x a uh, 4 plus b minus y3, right? So we want to minimize the largest deviation. So we want to avoid uh, big uh, uh, gaps. So that's another. Uh, criteriums of fitness, and this is in fact the criterion for which we will use uh, when we decide FIR filters uh, uh, using linear programming. So this is the uniform norm, so-called uniform norm. And I claim this problem, even though it involves absolute values, uh, is also a linear program can be massaged into a linear program. And let me show you how. And this is, in fact, the trick that we will be using in designing a critical filters without using Remix Exchange. You simply introduce a new variable, u. Say, uh, so introduce a new variable u and put the following. What will u be? u will be bound on the absolute values. So you will put the following constraint. Ax1 plus b minus y1 you want it smaller or equal than u. But you also want, because you want, this is what we want. We want this, right? And you will, we will try to minimize u. But this is not a linear constraint because of the absolute value. But this can be broken into two linear constraints, namely ax1 plus b minus y1 is smaller or equal than u but also minus AX1 plus B minus Y1 is also smaller or equal than U, right? Because we have absolute value of X is smaller than some B, even only if X is smaller than B, and also minus X is smaller than B. 
right? This is equivalent smaller or equal, say. This is, a, this is equivalent to that, right? Um, so we replace uh, all of these uh, by conditions like this. So you, we will have all of them at the end. We will have uh, ax4 plus b minus y4 should be smaller than u and uh, uh, minus uh, ax4 plus b minus y1 is smaller or equal than u. And these will be your constraints, right? And uh, um, the objective will be just minimize just the variable u. Simple constraint, right? So here the variables will be a, b, and u. Right? Um, so your objective is just variable u, and you want to minimize u such that u bounds absolute value of all of these. This will produce, right, and when it comes to if the fit is by polynomials, it will produce by Trebuchet theorem something called equiripple approximation in which the errors are approximates are of the deviations are of the same size. Do you understand this trick? This is really useful uh, stuff for applications. So you can allow absolute values in inequalities. Now we can think even of a third one, which is very important nowadays for something called compressive sensing. Uh, we can do the following. Yet another type of norm that we want to minimize that measures the discrepancy. So we might want to minimize the absolute value, the sum of absolute values of uh, a uh, y, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, x i minus b, uh, no, plus b uh, minus y i when i goes from 1 to 4 because we have four points. So if the ripple minimize the maximal value of this, but one also uh, important objective is to minimize the sum of absolute values of deviations. Uh, and interestingly enough, this can also be reduced to a linear program. So you see, uh, the point is, this is one of the reasons why linear programming is so important, because with uh, clever tricks, actually you can extend it to a, a large number of uh, prima facie non-linear problems, problems that are actually reducible to linear optimization problems. How do we do this? Uh, uh, having seen this, uh, what would you do? What will, would you introduce? Uh, now, you cannot have a single variable that bounds all. But now for each of these, uh, you can have a separate variable. So trick, uh, so minimize the L1 norm, uh, introduce new variable for each uh, constraint. And you will have the following. Uh, Ax1 plus b minus y1 smaller or equal than u1 
and also minus ax1 plus b minus y1 smaller than u1 and all the way ax4 minus plus b minus y4 um, smaller than u4 um, right and minus this uh, ax4 plus b minus y4 smaller than u4 and then you will minimize what? What do you think? What will be the objective if you want to minimize L1 norm? Exactly, sum of u's. Very good. Minimize u1 plus u2 plus u3 plus u4. And lo and behold, voila, you have a linear objective and linear constraints. And of course, u's are, uh, you can be assumed to be positive. But of course, a's can be, and b's can be both positive and negative. So to uh, allow for that, you will replace a by a1 minus a2, and b with b1 minus b2, and then you can force all the variables to be positive. So this is a really uh, important trick. Now, why is this important for compressive sensing, and what is compressive sensing? Uh, there is you, uh, uh, what we taught in 3121. Do you remember why your CD player can play distortion-free music, even though there are only discrete numbers, but it represents a continuous signal? Well, the uh, theoretical background is that uh, if you sample the signal at, twi at the rate twice the highest frequency present in the signal, then there is a unique signal that has these samples, unique band-limited signal that has these samples, right? But this is, uh, produces huge amount of data. Right? Uh, when you do the same trick with image, when you then what you do nowadays, you don't store music in this way. You use uh, some of these compressed formats that lose information. Similar applies to images. Uh, uh, you get pixels by pixels, but storing them in raw format is prohibitively produces prohibitively large files, so you do a lossy compression by finding an approximation of the original image that is described by sparse set of coefficients. Because how JPEG works, if you, uh, you know, you take something, it's not FFT, but actually a discrete cosine transform, which is just a version of FFT, essentially, and you pick you take only large components and set small components to zero, right? But now one can say, if n product is sparse, can I sample the signal in a way that I produce much smaller number of samples, but I can recover the original signal in, with sufficient accuracy? So if that would be, imagine if you had a camera that somehow in analog domain converts pixel values into discrete Fourier, into discrete cosine transform and outputs just the large coefficients, right? And why, was, why people were concerned with this? Sometimes uh, sampling uh, at Nyquist rate is prohibitively expensive, for example, at MRIs. Uh, you know, this is what spurred our research in uh, compressive sensing. You see, if you have kids uh, that need to get, uh, say, head MRI scan, it's a horrendous ordeal because they f scream in this small, right, and uh, uh, enclosure. It's uh, terribly stressful. And to get uh, the MRI by standard methods, it takes massive number of samples, right? So people started 
uh, researching, can you do MRI uh, scanning, taking some sparse number of samples, because at the end, uh, for high quality image, much sparser set of, of values will be enough to reconstruct. And lo and behold, it turns out remarkably well that you can do this remarkably well. Uh, what, uh, there is a, a, this interesting thing called one pixel camera. And it looks as follows. Uh, it has a lens. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, the CCD uh, 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 chip, the, you know, photosensitive chip with pixels, it actually has an LCD screen. And it has a simple, single photodiode. Uh, it has a light collimator, right, and uh, uh, that gathers. Uh, and the pixels are on LCD screen, and they can be either off or on. So you essentially, what you, what you can do is, uh, you can do, say, a thousand shots of the same scene, by different random patterns of pixels, what is on, what is off. And then you can actually, with high accuracy, you can recover the image just from these uh, uh, kind of gl global snapshots of uh, uh, the product of the image and the 0, 1 mass. Now, this problem of reconstruction is solved by an L1 norm minimization. So you will kind of put some approximate, you will take some approximation families that you want to do a fit, but instead of L2 fit, we do L1 fit. Why? Because L2 fit is this. Say, uh, when you do L1 fit, you find a point closest to the origin that is on your line, right? So where this circle touches this line. And you get your coordinates for the minimal distance. But both coordinates are likely to be non-zero. But how does an L1 uh, uh, sphere or circle looks like? L1 circle looks like this, right? Because if you see, this is precisely the set of points so that sum of this coordinate and that coordinate is precisely equal to 1. But this guy 